know there are a number of differences, of course, between the systems in the, in the UK and the US, um, one of which is that your conservative party has a coalition with yeah. the Liberal Democrats, um, which are people quite across the spectrum <laughs> from the conservatives. How does that work exactly? Basically what happened was the Conservative Party failed to win an overall majority, so it had 307 seats in Parliament and you need to win roughly about um, 320 seats to get, 320, 330 seats to get an overall majority in Parliament. So um, in order to govern, we had a choice. We could, the Conservative Party could either govern as a minority party, which has happened in the past, whereby you basically have a, a system called confidence and supply, which means you reach a deal with another party, in this case it would probably have been the Liberal Democrats, to say that they won't vote us down in the motion of no confidence, so they won't defeat the government, and that they um, will support the government on any budgetary measures that it introduces. But the, the, the worry that the Prime Minister had, um, and many people had, was that a time of tremendous economic uncertainty, a time where we inherited massive uh, rising debt and uh, government deficit, there was a need for some strong and some clear leadership. So he took the decision in the, the national interest to work with the Liberal Democrats and try and form a stable government, which meant instead of having a confidence and supply uh, mechanism, they actually joined the government and became part of the government. So Liberal Democrats sit in the cabinet and they have, they have government posts. So there is um, the business secretary is uh, a Liberal Democrat, the deputy prime minister is a Liberal Democrat, and, and various other um, Liberal Democrats hold uh, ministerial posts. But in order to make that work, clearly we're two parties who promised two different things in the uh, general election campaign and, and in our manifestos. So the, the two parties came together and negotiated really in very short order um, a coalition agreement. And the coalition agreement is sort of the document that enshrines the programme of government for the, um, for the government for the, the, the remaining, for, for the rest of the parliament. And in this case, also included in the coalition agreement, was an agreement that parliament would be fixed. It would be a five-year parliament. In the past, it's always been at the Prime Minister's um, discretion to, to ask the Queen if, if he can call an election. Uh, and, and he can do it at a time of his choosing that, that, that's most that in his political years? interest, up to five years. Whereas now it's fixed that the parliament will be five years. And the, the coalition agreement sets out the, our programme for government for, for doing that. So it's really what you're able to achieve as a coalition with a stable majority is a much more a radical programme of government than if you were in a confidence and supply situation where every vote you could potentially be defeated. So I think from that perspective it has definitely been a success that we've been able to achieve much more than we could otherwise. I mean clearly we're, there are two different parties with different outlooks and there are going to be areas that, that either party finds difficult and there's been lots of speculation about the, the state of the relationship. But in the end, the, that interest in working together, I think, will, will prevail and, and will give the country that, that stable leadership for, for the next five years. And certainly for people like myself who are <laughs> very, <laughs> very strong conservatives, it's been a, a real learning experience, learning to work with your, your Liberal Democrat colleagues. And certainly now we realise that we are two separate parties and we have two separate interests, but grown-up politics means that you should try and work together in order to... to to work in, in, in the best interests of the country. And so, for example, both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats in the field of education are, are committed for, to greater freedom for schools. Um, so we've introduced this programme of free schools, whereby if a group of parents or voluntary organisation wants to come along and set up a school, that's provided they can show there's demand for it, they can get that the money from the government that would, would normally have gone to a, would go to a state school, they can get the same amount of money um, and they can use it to set up a, a free school. And the, the idea of that is to really sort of create schools that, that people really want in their areas and have a, a, a real, uh, trying to capture the ethos of sort of schools that have that strong and independent leadership. And also we've introduced an academies programme whereby even existing schools are freed up from so much direct government control. So headmasters uh, and headmistress can take, uh, take control of those schools and, and influence the direction they're going in. Um, so that's an area where, where both parties have come together and have been able to be very bold. Similarly, in education we have this system of pupil premiums whereby children from disadvantaged backgrounds get more funding per capita, the idea being to try and incentivise schools to take those pupils, which again is a, is a, a radical idea. I think um, our Congress could, could use some tips on, on how to... <laughs> 
how to work together <laughs> that way. Do you have any tips for that? <laughs> well, you, you have a very different system. You have a, you have a two-party system and we have a three-party system. So I think the, I the, the, the situation might, might not arise. And I think it's, um, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, ascribe too noble uh, uh, motives to our politicians. It was the fact that we wanted to have a stable government and no party had won over a majority that, that led us to that situation. What, what have you observed about, about the political system here? I'm going to give you a, a, a start. I'm sure you have noticed the television ads that we are um, just drowning in. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's fascinating to come here. And we often say that in the UK, what happens in an American election will happen 18 months from now in a UK election. And America is, the United States is always seen at the vanguard of election campaigning techniques. And certainly the times I've spent here meeting with representatives from both the Democrat and the, the Republican Party is certainly in the field of um, uh, internet campaigning and Facebook and all and all that sort of social media. Uh, the, the US is, is a long way ahead of us in terms of, sort of how they are able to target voters and uh, engage with voters uh, via the, the internet. It's something that, that, that I think certainly both parties in the, all, all three parties in the UK will be seeking to learn lessons from. Um, but there are some very interesting differences. You, you, you refer to one broadcasting. Um, you cannot buy advertising on, uh, lecture advertising on British um, broadcasters. Uh, the way it works is that you are given an allotted amount of time, so so-called party political broadcasts. They're roughly sort of five minute, they're five minute slots that are shown on all the terrestrial broadcasts. That's to say the, the old broadcasters that existed before the advent of satellite and cable television, which still have command the biggest audiences. And you have about, I forget the exact number, but maybe, maybe about four of those uh, you can um, have in the run up to the election. Uh, but even those have strict um, uh, requir uh, sort of regulation of them. So uh, they try to clamp down on negative campaigning, so you can't use moving images of your opponents. So it's a, it's a much more limited form of um, communication than you have with television or advertising in the UK. And the other impact of that is on campaign financing. Mm. So one of the biggest cost drivers, I think, in American elections is trying to buy this uh, airtime. And you know, whenever I turn on the television, particularly in a swing state like Colorado, I'm bombarded by these, these television adverts. Uh, you, you don't get that in the UK, but it means the parties don't have to raise so much money. And uh, an interesting statistic, people have told me that this campaign is going to cost around five billion pounds in total in the US. In the UK, the um, election spending cap per party in the election campaign period is um, only around 20 million pounds. So it's a, a completely different order of, of magnitude. One thing that we're all familiar with hearing is what I guess is called prime minister's questions. Yeah. When everyone is talking at once, yeah. tell us about that. This is the sort of, this is the weekly bear pit in the House of Commons, basically. So what happens is the, the prime minister comes to the Commons at midday on a Wednesday, and for half an hour, he can basically be asked any question uh, as long as it pertains to his responsibilities as Prime Minister. So first of all, the Prime Minister has to be on tip top on top of every single element of government policy because he could be asked about any element of government policy. Um, and then secondly, the leader of the opposition, uh, the, which in this case is the leader of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband, um, can ask the Prime Minister six questions. So that, that is a period of sustained questioning. The wall of noise that hits the Prime Minister with the sort of 300 opposition MPs get sort of uh, jeering and baying at him and his side hopefully cheering for him is you know it's a really sort of it's 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 very politics clever. at its rawest <laughs> yes thank you very much for the glimpse into uh, british politics with oliver dowden political advisor to the british prime minister david cameron thank you very much thank you <laughs>